recognize the importance of improving our government's ability to harness the strength of its various agencies. By promoting interagency cooperation, the Simon Center is helping to strengthen our national security capabilities so that our country and its citizens are better prepared for their future. Mr. President, I notice the absence of quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. The Majority Leader. I ask unanimous consent the call the quorum be terminated. Without objection. I, ask, I now ask unanimous consent that on Wednesday, October 19th, when the Senate resumes consideration of H.R. 2112, the time until noon be equally divided between Senators McCain and Boxer or the designees. That's for debate on McCain Amendment number 739. That at noon the Senate proceed to vote in relation to the McCain Amendment. That there be no amendments or points of order in order to the amendment prior to the vote other than budget points of order. Is there objection? Without objection, so ordered. As you ask, consent the Senate proceed to executive session to consider the following nominations. Count number 429, 430, 431, 432, 433, 434, 435. That the nominations be confirmed and block. Motion reconsider be considered made and laid on the table with no anything action or debate. No further motions be in order to any of the nominations. Any related statements be printed in the record and President Obama be immediately notified of the Senate's action and the Senate then resume legislative session. Without objection. I ask unanimous consent the Energy Committee be discharged from further consideration of S-925 and the Senate proceed to con the immediate consideration of the following bills on block. Count number 129, S-270. Calendar number 132, S-292. Calendar number 133, S-333. Calendar number 134, S-334. Calendar number 136, S-404. Calendar number 184, H.R. 489. Calendar number 185, H.R. 470. Calendar number 186, H.R. 765 and S-925. Is there objection to proceeding to the measures on block? Without objection, so ordered. If there's, if I ask you consent that the committee amendments where applicable be agreed to the motion, the bill as amended be amended. Let's start that over again, Mr. President. I ask consent that the committee amendments where applicable be agreed to. The bills as amended, if amended, be read a third time and passed. The motions to reconsider be laid upon the table. Without objection, so ordered. I now ask that the Senate proceed to S. Conrad's 32. The clerk will report. Senate Concurrent Resolution 32 to authorize the Clerk of the House of Representatives to make technical corrections in the enrollment of H.R. 470 and so forth and for other purposes. Don't need to do anything with that. I ask Without objection, the Senate will proceed. Thank you. I ask the resolution be agreed to and motion to reconsider be laid on the table. Without objection. I now ask unanimous consent the Senate proceed to S.R.S. 298. The clerk will report. Senate Resolution 298 expressing support for the designation of October 20th, 2011 as the National Day on Writing. Is there objection to proceeding to the measure? Without objection, the Senate will proceed. I ask the announcement consent the resolution be agreed to, the preamble be agreed to, the motion we consider be laid on the table. There, are no, there be no intervening action or debate, and any related statements be printed on the record as if read. Without objection. I ask the announcement consent that when the Senate completes the business day, we adjourn until 9.30 a.m. on Wednesday, October 19th, that following the prayer and the pledge, journal proceedings be approved to date. The morning hour be deemed expired, and the time for the two leaders be reserved for their use later in the day. Following any later remarks, the Senate be in a period of morning business for up to one hour with Senators permitted to speak. 
up to 10 minutes each with the time equally divided and controlled between the leaders or the designees, with the Republicans controlling the first half, majority controlling the final half. Following up morning business, Senate resumed consideration of H.R. 2112, Agriculture, CGS, and Transportation Appropriation Bill, as under the previous order. Without objection. First roll call vote then will occur about noon tomorrow, in relation to Amendment Number 739. There is no further business to come before the Senate. I ask the adjournment of the previous order following the remarks of Senator Murkowski of Alaska. Without objection. Mr. President. Senator from Alaska. Mr. President, I request permission to speak for up to one hour. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Tonight, today, is a, is a celebration in Alaska. Tonight is the 144th anniversary of Alaska Day. This is the day that commemorates the first raising of the stars and stripes over Lord Baranoff's castle in Sitka, Alaska. And at the time, uh, Sitka was called New Archangel. And until that moment, it was the capital of Russia, America. And we celebrate Alaska's statehood today, October 18th. We also celebrate our, our 52 year old compact with the United States and its promise to grant Alaskans the opportunity to participate equally with the other states of the Union. Together with Hawaii, statehood for Alaska marked the last chapter in America's great westward expansion. Of course, that expansion really began well before Alaska's statehood, well before the purchase from Russia. And it really goes back to Thomas Jefferson's Northwest Ordinances, which promised an equal footing for a state government to stand up on its own and to make that leap out of territorial status. And this resulted in states like Ohio, like Indiana, forming as sovereign governments with the federal government relinquishing almost all control over the lands within those borders. So people came to live, to build their lives in these new states, and with their new lives came the infrastructure, came the roads, the bridges, the factories, and the industry. And that set things in motion for expansion into the far west. Frontier states like Wyoming and Nevada, Utah, Montana, then gold, in California and Colorado really brought an urgency to the expansion. We saw the railroads that helped accelerate and accommodate it. But as times passed, the terms began to change. Precedents were increasingly set for vast federal land withdrawals in the form of national forests, monuments, parks, and preserves. And the promise and the definition of equal footing changed during these times. And ultimately, more states had uh, more of an equal footing than others, as we saw the newest uh, Western states would soon have to contend with federal land managers. Now, none of this, though, took away from the hope that Alaskans felt when Secretary of State William Seward negotiated the purchase of Alaska from Tsar Nicholas, and he negotiated this purchase for $7.2 million. And Mr. President, we're talking a lot about money nowadays and um, usually talking in billions rather than millions, but just think about it. The purchase of Alaska came at the price of $7.2 million. That's about two cents an acre, which is clearly a deal under anybody's terms. And so back in Sitka today, this day is always commemorated by the town's biggest parade of the year. It's a time of celebration, really, when many Alaskans remember the hope that they felt for a brighter future when we became the 49th state in the Union back in 1959. Now, in 1959, I was only a year old. And uh, so when President Eisenhower signed that statehood act into law, can't really have much of an impression at that point in time. But I, I have felt, and I still feel, like I've grown up with Alaska, that we have both matured over the years. And those that know me 
know that I can go on and on extolling the virtues of, of my state. Uh, for something as, as simple as, as potatoes, I will brag that, well, we might not have the biggest potatoes in the country, but our potatoes are germ-free. We're bigger, we're better, we've got more sun, we've got more darkness, it's colder, it's warmer. We are a land of extremes. We are an incredible place. Alaska is unparalleled in its beauty and its potential, and there's really always been something that's very classically American about Alaska. It is truly our nation's last frontier, a place where it is still possible for adventurous men and women to live the greatest version of the American dream, and I think that's what draws so many people to our state. They, they still believe that there is a place where you can live on the edge of a lot of possibility. And that continues to make us a remarkable place to be. Statehood itself was a dream for many, many years among our pioneers and our native people. It didn't come quickly and it certainly did not come easily. Prior to statehood, we only had territorial status in the United States and that left us without any vote here in the Congress. We weren't entitled to receive funding from many programs, including for, for highways. We were at the mercy of the generosity of the federal government. We were at the mercy of those out-of-state interests which had locked in a foothold over many of our resources. I uh, was born and raised in, in southeastern Alaska. My grandparents uh, uh, raised their families there, and I can remember stories about the push for statehood stemming from the desire to control our fisheries, the salmon wars that went on at that time. Ultimately, statehood came about after 92 long years and only after heroic efforts from a great many individuals, too many to do justice here this evening. But for purposes of my statement tonight, I would like to invoke three names that some in this town and some in this chamber may still remember. The first is our former governor and senator, Ernest Greening, whose seat in this chamber I'm humbled to hold. Senator Greening was really, uh, he was an intellectual titan. He was the consummate public servant. He was an alumnus of Harvard Medical School. He was a prolific journalist who served as editor to both the New York Tribune and the magazine, The Nation. He also contributed to the Atlantic Monthly. And in the, the epic novel, Alaska, which was written by James Michener, he credited Senator Greening with publicizing the cause for Alaskan statehood at the national level. And he called him perceptive and gifted. As a testament to his legacy, Ernest Greening's statue now stands just a few steps away from here in the Capitol Visitors Center. Another individual, a man who, who truly built our, our state, was Wally Hickel. He was a former governor. He was the man who President Nixon was so impressed with that he named him as his Secretary of the Interior. Wally was a, was a former boxer from Kansas. He, he arrived in Alaska with, the legend goes, about 37 cents in his pocket. But he rose to prominence in, in both business and politics. And he was at the forefront of negotiating statehood, he understood the critical balance between the federal interests and the state interests, between the corporate interests and the public interest. Governor Hickel is important to this conversation because Alaska is where he saw and realized the American dream all the while with, with a clear eye and a vision towards the future of our state. We lost Wally Hickel last spring, but his writings and his vision clearly continue to guide our state. And a third man I want to, to bring up this evening is a man that I was privileged to work for and to serve with, and that is the late Senator Ted Stevens. I hold Senator Stevens, or Uncle Ted as, as many in the state uh, referred to him, I hold him in great personal and professional regard. He was a World War II pilot, who's a Harvard law lawyer, who served as prosecutor in the territorial days. He was a congressional liaison to President Eisenhower. He was an attorney for the Interior Department. Much of the legwork 
that is associated with statehood was Ted's. And much of what Alaska has become is directly attributable to his work here in this chamber. But Ted's work and his influence carried so much further beyond Alaska. His work in matters of national defense, in telecom, in fisheries, they shaped national and global politics. And he was truly, he was truly larger than life. He made Alaska matter in a way that nobody could have imagined. And without him, it's indisputable that we wouldn't have the opportunities that we have now. Now, Mr. President, the reason that I invoke these names is to remind my colleagues about the consequential nature, the gravitas of great men and women who made sure that Alaska became our 49th state. These were exceptional Americans with an exceptional vision. They really qualify as the founding fathers of my home state. They knew what Thomas Jefferson knew at the time of the Northwest Ordinances, that the new state of Alaska didn't have the population at the time and wasn't likely to get the population. They didn't have the infrastructure to support an economy and that it would not succeed without open access to its huge natural resource base. And this is why they negotiated 104 million acres of pure state land and a 90% share of revenues from resource development on federal lands. And this is compared to the 50% that's enjoyed by the rest of the states. There was no clear path to Alaska's self-sufficiency without these terms. And as a matter of fact, Mr. President, there still isn't. In 1958, the U.S. Senate's official committee report on the Alaska Statehood Act promised Alaska that it would be given great latitude to develop its resources. It read, and I'll quote here, some of the additional costs connected with statehood will be met by granting the state a reasonable return from federal exploitation of resources within the new state. In the past, the United States has controlled the lion's share of resources and in some instances retained the lion's share of the proceeds. This situation, though, has not proved conducive to development of the Alaskan economy. The committee deems it only fair that when the state relieves the United States of most of its expense burden, the state should receive a realistic portion of the proceeds from resources within its borders. That's the end of the quote, but there is more to this. Secretary of Interior Fred Seaton, while in Alaska in early uh, summer of 1958 to deliver speeches about Alaska statehood, he said that the statehood compact, and I'll quote him here, reaffirms Alaska's preferential treatment in receiving 90% of all revenues from oil, gas, and coal leasing on public domain. And then in Fairbanks, he went further promising, and again a, a quote, since early this year the territory has received 90% of all lease, oil lease revenues and the state of Alaska will continue to do so. End of his quote. These statements are, are remarkably clear. Alaska would be allowed to develop its resources and receive most of the revenues from that development. And Mr. President, I truly wish that I could stand here tonight, all these years later, to say that these promises have been upheld. I wish that I could go to sleep tonight or any night knowing that the federal government had kept its promises to the people of Alaska and that my children and their children will surely see our state continue to prosper and come into its own. But the reality is, the reality is, Mr. President, that Alaska's relationship with the federal government has become strained. The federal government has always had a significant presence in the last frontier, from the first Alaska day to this one. But today, at a time when Alaskans need the federal government to act as our partner, it has become an obstacle. 
Its default position is no longer to enable prosperity for Alaskans. More often than not, the federal government now delays or really denies those opportunities. And that leaves me worried. It leaves me concerned about the future of my state, not because of the global economy, not because of high unemployment levels, but because of the treatment that we receive at the hands of our own federal government. And I'm here today to say that this treatment can't go on like this. It cannot. And I want to ensure that my colleagues here in the Senate understand why. I've asked for a large block of time here, Mr. Mr. President. I don't usually take, uh, take a lot of, of floor time, and particularly to go back into history. But this, this is important to not only my state's past, but my state's future. And so I'd like to, to explain some of, of, of what we are dealing with. And some of this may not be easy for, for some to see. Some believe that Alaska and, and the rest of the country, for that matter, is, is past the point where we need to develop our resources. Many of our newer members may not understand the promises that were made to Alaska upon statehood, and therefore they don't understand what's been happening since then. Adding to the complication is that our resource options have been greatly restricted over the course of decades, not individual months or, or even years. So to understand what, what has changed, we, we can't look back to the start of this administration. I'm not going to single out the, the present administration and say, you're not letting us do something. The fact of the matter is, Mr. President, we've got, we've got to go back. We've got to go back many administrations. We've got to go all the way back to the late 1970s, a time when much of Alaska had already been withdrawn into federal wilderness status. President Carter and his interior secretary had decided that well, that wasn't enough. They designated over 56 million more acres of new national monuments, 40 million more acres of wildlife refuges, and 11 million more acres of restricted national forests. Now, that in and of itself would have been unprecedented, unprecedented in terms of the amount of land for the federal government to unilaterally withdraw if it were nationwide. But this land was all in Alaska. Every acre of it was in Alaska. So not surprisingly, this came over the state's objection. Congress reacted to this tremendous federal overreach so that Alaska senators and lone congressmen, together with a few, few sympathetic colleagues, could at least try to control that impact. And that negotiated truce was the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, we call it ANILCA for short. In, in no uncertain terms, ANILCA was a compromise. It was clearly a compromise. And for his part, President Carter stated when he signed ANILCA into law, he said, quote, 100% of the offshore areas and 95% of the potentially productive oil and mineral areas will be available for exploration or for drilling. Again, that's President Carter saying that 100% of offshore areas, 95% of potentially productive oil and mineral areas will be available for oil, for exploration, and or for drilling. Pretty strong statement. And it seemed pretty clear, very reassuring at the time of this compromise. But today, it stands as probably the worst broken promise that the federal government has ever made to the state of Alaska. As the Interior Department reported just this past spring, less than 1%, less than 1% of federal lands in Alaska are currently producing oil or natural gas. Mr. President, I would suggest that that's an indictment. A significant portion of our lands have been placed off limits and then where development is allowed is often stalled by federal red tape. And that's wrong. It's wrong, it's unacceptable, and it's to the detriment of both Alaska and our nation as a whole. Alaska is nearly 
4,000 miles from where we are here in Washington, D.C. I know because I log that trip on Alaska Airlines quite frequently. And I know that what makes news back home doesn't always make news here. So I'd like to use part of my time tonight to provide the Senate with some of the many examples of how resource development in my home state is being held back. And let's start with mining. Back in 2009, the EPA attempted to halt the Kensington gold mine from proceeding in southeast Alaska. And this happened after two decades, two decades of agency review and legal challenges. It happened even though the Supreme Court had ruled that a crucial permit for the mine was indeed valid. But the EPA was so unhappy with this decision that it jumped back in. It sought to nullify the plan that had just held up to the scrutiny of the Supreme Court. And Mr. President, this is not the Alaska Supreme Court. This is the United States Supreme Court. This was not an effort to protect the environment as the EPA. The EPA proposal was, was demonstrably worse for the environment. This was, was an effort to stop the mine at all costs, regardless of the consequences for the local economy or the hundreds of Alaskans who were depending on jobs from this particular mine. Now, more recently, we've seen from senators within this body from other states challenge a mine that could one day be located in southwest Alaska. Those senators have asked the EPA to consider a preemptive veto of the mine, but this is even before a plan has been proposed. Now, I have suggested, I have said that a preemptive veto makes no more sense than a preemptive approval and that we should provide a robust environmental review when and if a permit application is going to be submitted. Now, I will remind everyone here, we don't have a habit of hastily approving mines here in this country. In fact, we rank dead last, dead last among all the countries in the world in the amount of time it takes to review permits. This mine will have to secure at least 67 different permits, approvals, and authorizations from federal, state, and local governments. That represents about 67 chances for the mine to be delayed, modified, or halted. But some apparently believe that that process is still not sufficient. Now let's talk about timber. There is the wholesale destruction of the timber industry in southeast Alaska. Now at this point, again, I feel like I need to, 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 to put my Alaska bona fides out there and remind everybody how big Alaska is. We're, we're more than twice the size of Texas. People forget that. We've got a lot of room up there. We could produce a tremendous portion of our nation's timber and pulp if we were only allowed to do so. We could do that while leaving vast, vast majority of our lands untouched, but that hasn't been possible. Southeast Alaska is nearly all federal lands. And so our ability to conduct logging there is very heavily dependent on the federal government's willingness to, to grant access. Now, when ANILCA passed, the timber industry, in return for accepting the creation of more than 5 million acres of new national monuments closed to timber harvesting, they were assured that the Forest Service would make 450 million board feet of timber available in the future, half of what was being produced prior to the bill's passage. But we accepted that as a compromise. But ANILCA also guaranteed a $40, $40 million worth of funding each year for road building, for pre-commercial thinning, to allow the existing industry to survive on a smaller land base. So you've got to ask the question, well, what happened? Alaska's timber industry has not thrived. It struggles. You'd go down to southeastern, you'd talk to people in Ketchikan or out in Thorn Bay, and it's worse than struggling. They are on life support. They're struggling to survive as outside forces repeatedly attempt to shut it down. 
At the urging of Washington, D.C.'s environmental community, the funding within ANILCA was repealed, and the allowable harvest level was cut in half again over the following decade. But even that reduced amount of logging seems expansive today because the Forest Service has made far less than 50 million board feet available for timber harvest within the past three years. So far this year, the Forest Service has amazingly sold just 2 million board feet of new timber offerings. This is a dramatic decline for an industry that once provided thousands of well-paying jobs for, for residents in Southeast Alaska, as well as the revenue that came in. And by the way, some really world-class quality wood and, and pulp resources for the rest of our country. Given these restrictions, it probably comes as no surprise that employment in the industry has plummeted from about 6,000 total jobs in 1980 to about where we are today, which is about 450. And that, that includes all of the, the, uh, the support structure as well. So for, for those of us who, who grew up in the Tongass, I was born in Ketchikan, raised in, in places like Juneau and Wrangell to see an economy be truly just cut off to the point that it is no longer existent because of federal policies is very difficult, very difficult to deal with. Then, of course, we can take a look at Alaska's oil and gas industry. Currently provides nearly 90% of the revenues for Alaska's state budget, and historically, as much as 20% of our nation's petroleum supply. We're pretty proud of this. We feel like we've done a pretty good job. Here, more than anywhere else, we see the scope and the consequence of federal decisions to restrict resource development. We've, uh, just to, to put things in context, so that people know what we're talking about, I don't have the rest of the country on here, Mr. President, because that chart is coming later. But in, in understanding where Alaska's resources lie, I think it, it helps to understand the, the, the management um, uh, and the, the division, if you will, within our state in terms of, of our lands. The, the map, which I don't expect most can see, is kind of a jumble of colors. But what I will direct you two, and, and to those who are, are looking at this, is all of the green areas are our forest service and, uh, and the, the orange and tan areas are our BLM uh, parklands. The areas that are in blue are the state lands. The small areas where you have red are, are areas that are held in, in, in private lands, uh, whether it's, it's native lands or whether it is, is held in, in private lands. But up here in the National Petroleum Reserve, up at the top of the state, this is an area that Congress has explicitly designated. They have singled out, they've explicitly designated for producing oil federal regulators will not allow a simple bridge to be built over a remote river. Without this bridge, it is not possible, or it's exceptionally difficult, to begin commercial production. So you've got production within a national petroleum reserve that's remaining off limits at this moment. And I've asked the question, and it's not a rhetorical question, but it's, worth, it's clearly worth repeating. If we can't get petroleum from the National Petroleum Reserve, where, where can we get it from? This is an area that was specifically designated by the Congress, and we're being held up from accessing this because we cannot get approval to place a bridge over the Colville River. So, Mr. Mr. President, we continue to work this because it's, it's extraordinary that we would be held up these many years. Offshore, in the Beaufort and the Chukchi, these areas are estimated to contain more than 20 billion barrels of oil. 
Production in these areas could help us refill our pipeline, which is running dangerously low, create many thousands of good paying jobs. But federal regulators have held this up over, really of all things, air permits needed for exploratory operations to begin miles offshore in the Arctic Ocean. We've seen some, some steps in the right direction and that's good, but the fact of the matter is, is that drilling has been canceled each of the last four seasons and, and next year is still uncertain. I had an opportunity to quiz uh, Director Brom, Bromwich today. He's, he's trying to give me the assurance that this might be on track for next season, but it has been almost five years and almost four billion dollars in an effort to get to the point where you can proceed to begin exploration. Alaska has already lost hundreds of jobs and millions in revenues because of these federally impo imposed delays. Of course, I cannot, cannot not talk about Alaska's oil and gas resources without discussing Alaska's coastal plain, which is this area right over here to adjoin Canada. We've got an area up north that is estimated to hold 10.4 billion barrels of oil. This is the mean estimate, so it's quite possibly much more than that. I have sponsored legislation to allow responsible development in the non-wilderness portion, not in the wilderness portion of Anwar, and we're not going to touch that, in the non-wilderness portion of Anwar, and I've offered this for several Congresses now, but even limiting that development to 0.01% of the refuge has proven unacceptable to many, many members of this chamber. We repeatedly hear from others that, well, this, this area is too sensitive, um, and, you know, despite Alaska's very strong record of environmental stewardship in, in nearby Prudhoe Bay. We repeatedly hear that it's just going to take too long for this oil to come to market. They'll say, well, it's going to take 10 years to get Anwar oil. That's just too long. But Mr. President, the, the, the 10 years away argument has been made for over 20 years now. So instead of, of, of continuing to delay, continuing to delay, let's figure out how we make this happen. But instead of seeking to promote any promotion, here in Congress and from the Fish and Wildlife Service, we face efforts to put all of the coastal plain into permanent wilderness restriction. To anyone who thinks that the non-wilderness portion of ANWR was never meant for energy development, I would point you to President Eisenhower's original designation creating not a refuge, but the Arctic Range. And I would also remind you that President Eisenhower had both an assistant to the Secretary of the Interior Department and a congressional liaison, and that individual was named Ted Stevens. Ted was in the room with Interior Secretary Seton drafting the executive order for the Arctic Range Conservation Program. And if you think that he would have considered locking up Alaska's resources, I don't think you know him as, as I did. The order clearly provided that oil and gas development would be permitted so long as there were reasonable protections in place for the flora and the fauna. I would encourage any of my colleagues, look up this executive order of December 6, 1960, if you've got any further questions. Now, for all of its broken promises, ANILCA is still law, and it contains two very important provisions that were negotiated by Senator Stevens. The first is for an oil and gas exploratory program to occur in the 1002 area. This is the small portion of the, uh, of the uh, uh, coastal plain that I sought to open. But I want to repeat this. Existing law provides for oil and gas exploration and exploratory drilling has already occurred in Anwar. In fact, in the two winters in 1984 and 1985, Seismic exploration was conducted along 1,400 miles of survey lines in Anwar. There were several companies that were also permitted to conduct other geologic studies like surface rock and uh, um, sampling and mapping and some geochemical testing. This resulted 
in a report from the Interior Department based on what it learned about the resource and the ability to develop it responsibly, recommending that Congress take the next step and authorize oil and gas leasing for the entire 1002 area. So you, you have to ask the question, why is this relevant? To begin with, it's worth noting that the current law already provides for exploratory drilling in Anwar. All that is prohibited, and I quote, is development leading to production. I really doubt that many people realize that we've actually already authorized drilling in Anwar and Congress's real decision is to decide whether or not we leave the oil in there or whether we let it come to market. Now the second major provision in ANILCA is probably better known. It's called the No More Clause and we talk about it a lot in Alaska. It's an express prohibition on any more wilderness withdrawals within Alaska. Included is a congressional finding that Alaska has unequivocally contributed enough of its lands to conservation purposes. And I'm going to quote directly from this law. It's, it's been upheld in court. It remains in place today. And it provides as follows. This act provides sufficient protection for the national interest in the scenic, cult natural, cultural, and environmental values on the public lands in Alaska and at the same time provides adequate opportunity for satisfaction of the economic and social needs of the state of Alaska and its people. Accordingly, the designation and disposition of the public lands in Alaska pursuant to this act are found to represent a proper balance between the reservation of national conservation system units and those public lands necessary and appropriate for more intensive use and disposition, and thus Congress believes that the need for future legislation designating new conservation system units, new con national conservation areas, or new national recreation areas has been obviated thereby. Mr. Mr. President, I don't, I don't think it could be any more clear than that. So it troubles me, it troubles me a great deal when people here in Washington then take it upon themselves to look for more wilderness in Alaska. In, in 2004, the, the GSA, the General Services Administration, reported that more than 60% of Alaska was owned by the federal government, about 250 million acres in total. So again, you look at, at the map here, and outside of the, the blue areas, pretty much all that you are seeing, the green, the, the kind of tan, the orange, these are all federal areas here. So about 250 million acres owned by the federal government. Compare that with some of the other states. Now I don't mean to pick on the smaller states, but Connecticut, 0.4 percent of Connecticut, about 14,000 uh, federal acres. New York is 0.8 percent, about 230,000 federal acres. Illinois, 1.8 percent. Um, they've got about 640,000 federal acres. But again, according to that report, we've got the state of Alaska with about 250 million acres of land under federal control. So you say, well, where's your, where's your private lands? Less than 1 percent of Alaska's lands are privately held. And people have a, a tough time with that because they think, well, you've got so much land, you've got so much acreage, it's so huge. Surely, you must have some of that in, in private land, and it is less than 1%. So it, it, it begs the question. Um, really, when we're, when we're looking to add more wilderness, how fair is it to look to Alaska for more wilderness? when you have some 250 million acres in, in federal control already, uh, more wilderness in Alaska in one state than in the rest of the nation combined. So uh, it, is, it is an important question to be asked. Now, you would at least suppose that the vast areas where Alaska cannot develop our resources would, would give us a silver lining of, of more uh, recreational access. I know, Mr. President, that, that you enjoy the great outdoors, as do I, and we like to, to get out and hike and, and, and be part of, of what, uh, the, the, what we have with the land. But 
with Alaska's land management, even access to our lands makes it complicated. And that, that promise, too, has been broken. Under ANILCA, Alaska's outdoor recreational enthusiasts were promised access to the 120 million acres of new parks, of refuges, and wilderness areas. So again, whether it's your, your forest service lands, your park service lands here, your, your refuge lands, um, that was all promised that, okay, it's, it's there, it's, it's for you to enjoy, but as we feared, soon after the bill was passed, after ANILCA passed, federal agencies closed access. They closed access by snow machines, they closed access uh, by road, they ac closed access by plane to some of the lands. So in other words, you can enjoy access, you can enjoy this if you can walk there. And that's good for you and I who are still able-bodied and you're, you're uh, much stronger when you're going up those mountains, but the fact of the matter is, is that it, it is limited if you can't access it by any other means other, other than than walking there. It went further, the access issue went further when Glacier Bay was eventually shut off to commercial fishing entirely. It especially hurt where Alaskans whose property then became in holdings within these new conservation areas. They faced regulations just five years after this law was passed that made permission for access into their lands much more difficult, clearly much more expensive, and sometimes shutting them out altogether. To this day, I deal with constituents who, who are out here in the McCarthy area, a uh, 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 great park area, but there are inholdings, private inholdings, but in order to gain access to their property that is rightly there and the federal government recognizes it, they say, well, you can be there, but we're just going to make it extraordinarily difficult for you to gain access to your own property. So the, the, the promise that we as Alaskans would be able to enjoy this incredible land that we have, even that has been hindered. Mr. President, I, I have chosen to speak about these broken promises today because I want to make clear that both history and the law point squarely to Alaska's right to the use and the enjoyment of its lands. And, and while the law should be well enough, we can't forget why good public policy weighs in favor as well. The decisions to block Alaskan development have come to a head at, at really the worst possible time. We've got high unemployment, we've got record federal debt, we've got a global financial uh, distress. Alaska could really help on all of these fronts, we stand ready to create tens of thousands of jobs. We can create hundreds of billions of dollars in new federal revenues. We can help relieve the staggering costs our nation pays for foreign oil, but we need permission from the federal government. At times, it seems that, that many in this chamber have forgotten why we need to produce our natural resources in the first place. And the answer is, is really pretty simple. It leads to economic growth, it leads to prosperity, and it helps us compete in a rapidly changing world. But because we've slowed down resource production, because we have locked down so much of our lands, our nation is increasingly, and I believe needlessly, facing scarcity issues and dependency, dependent on foreign sources for so many of the resources that we depend upon. And in terms of many of these crucial resources, whether it be energy, timber, minerals, Alaska is not just the last frontier. It is truly the best option. <clears throat> and I'm not overstating the case to say that much of our nation's competitiveness rests on our ability to access our resources. Right now, right now though, we're constantly blocked and production Production is happening all around us. Just look at what's going on. We had a hearing today in the Energy Committee discussing what is happening offshore of Cuba. Well, it's not just happening offshore of Cuba. It's offshore in Russia. It's offshore in Canada. It's down in Mexico. It's in Cuba. We can 
We, we, you know, we, we can look to China for our rare earth elements, but why would we do that when we have the prospects here in this country, in Alaska? Alaska has these resources. The positive benefits that would result if we reversed the current dynamic are not up for debate. Countless studies clearly show that development in Alaska, because of its grand scale and high resource values, will create jobs and economic benefits for literally every single state, for your state of Colorado, for all of our states. And this does not require clear-cutting the state or drilling every inch of our state or every acre or ever, every region, not even close, not even close. We are asking to pursue development on a very small amount of land, especially when you consider Alaska's prolific standards. So, yeah kind of put it into context of the whole, and I hope that you can see the outline of the, the lower 48 states here and Alaska superimposed. I didn't just put Alaska in the middle there because it looks better in the middle. What I'm trying to show is that this is, this is a proportionate picture of how Alaska, if it were superimposed over the lower 48, where we extend to all the way in southeastern Ketchikan over here, which is, sits in Florida, to fully the, the furthest part of the west coast, which is the Aleutian Islands, all the way down here, uh, going all the way up to the north and into the south. The, the reality is that Alaska is a state whose size can't easily be, be measured or even understood. As I mentioned, it's, its most distant points stretch from Florida to California. You lay it across the continental United States like this, and people say, you must be making it up. Well, Mr. President, you've had the opportunity to travel to my state. You appreciate that when you're flying in an airplane for hours and still looking down and realizing I'm still flying over the same state, you can appreciate the size and scope of, of what we're dealing with. And within this area, lies a tremendous natural resource base, conventional and unconventional, renewable and non-renewable. And, and when you see Alaska on a map, you never see it represented in proportionate size. You never realize just how unbelievably large it is. Unfortunately, for for years, when I was in school, Alaska was always in the little box down off of California or off of Mexico, that little piece down there, and, and, and our kids didn't know where the exact spot on the map was. They didn't know the size. We're continuing to educate, and educate in an important way because it does make a difference. Um, before I go off this chart, I, I, I want to, again, kind of put in context the ownership, the management issues that we deal with. You look at, at this green area, this would be 60, about 64% of Alaska is under federal management. State manage, management is about 24.5%, uh, about 90 million acres. 10% uh, is, is native held, and then less than 1%. About a million acres are in, in private hands. It kind of gives you a, an appreciation of what it is that we're dealing with. Now, Mr. President, you and I have had an opportunity to talk about some of the, the, the truly magical places that you have enjoyed in Alaska, and I appreciate um, your perspective and, and the special places that you have been. There is no argument, you will not find argument from this Alaskan, that major portions of Alaska are truly worth protecting and should not be developed. Those are, are some pretty spectacular areas. Um, you may see them advertised. Uh, oftentimes you'll have environmental groups that will advertise them. Um, uh, the photographs may or may not always um, reflect the actual proposed sites, but, uh, but they're beautiful. We will not ever dispute that they are beautiful. The current Deputy Secretary of the Interior has said that we're not going to drill in our pristine wilderness any more than we're going to build a dam in the Grand Canyon. But Mr. President, we're not proposing that. We're not proposing that, but not by any legal or, or common sense definition. We have in our state 
five major oil bearing regions that remain non producing. We've got a pipeline that is dwindling at one third of its capacity. This pipeline just literally bisects the state of Alaska. It is the spinal cord of our state's economy. It's a critical artery for America's energy security. But right now, that pipeline is running low, it's running slow, and we're being prevented from accessing resources to fill it back up. We've negotiated, we've pleaded, we've begged for access to our resources for more than a generation. We've even been willing to sacrifice some of the revenues that Alaska is clearly entitled to by law, and it's fallen on positively deaf ears here in Washington, even at a time when those dollars would mean quite a lot in terms of avoiding painful tax hikes or program cuts. When you look back on the past 50 years, it's, it's more than a little astonishing that opposition to development continues to be so just dug in. And what has borne out from Alaska's resource development, I think, is, is a very strong record of environmental stewardship. We have produced our natural resources for generations. For my entire life there, we have been producing our resources, whether it's our timber, whether it's our fisheries, whether it's mining, and now oil. We have produced them for generations and we have preserved our pristine qualities and the natural beauty perfectly. We are a world-class vacation destination for everyone who wants to come up on the big cruise ships to those who want to do the eco-tourism. We are a genuine paradise for the trophy fishermen, for the hunters that want to come to Alaska. We've got a fish and game management program that is the most productive, the most sustainable model for the entire world. I have people tell me, the one thing I want to do before I die is come to Alaska and see it. So Mr. President, if we've been producing all of our resources for all these years, for all these generations, if we've really been doing that terrible of a job, how come everybody wants to see this incredible, beautiful land that we have? And I would suggest it's because we've been doing a pretty good job of the resource development as we have gone along the course. Resource production has yielded substantial social and economic benefits to the state. More than 16 billion barrels of oil have been sent to the lower 48 with minimal environmental impact. Our oil also supplies refineries near Fairbanks and Anchorage. It allows us to serve as an international cargo hub. Our refineries produce the fuel for fighter jets and other military needs at our four bases. The strategic value of Alaska's geographical position, we sit literally at the top of the world there for, for military purposes alone, is sufficient to justify access to the resource, even if we were to ignore the jobs, ignore the revenue and the energy security benefits that come along with it. But yet as I stand here today, virtually every extractive industry in Alaska has been disrupted by the federal government. Mining, timber, oil and gas, all these productions are, are, are well below or well behind the levels that would best serve Alaska and our country. No matter what the project is, it seems that we've got to fight the federal government for access and permission every single step of the way. Federal agencies attempting to subvert Supreme Court decisions. Senators from other states attempting to halt mines that have not even been proposed. Permits are delayed, they're withheld, they're outright refused. Drilling can't take place in places that Congress has explicitly designated for drilling, including a National Petroleum Reserve. At the root of these troubles really is Alaska's treatment by the federal government. Because we have so much land and because we do depend on the development of these lands to thrive as a state, Alaska's future truly rests in the federal government's hands. But at the very moment, at the time when we most need the federal government to be acting as our partner, it's become an obstacle to progress and to our prosperity. The promises that were made at statehood and under ANILCA seem to be remembered only by Alaskans. So it's apparent to me that the system of federal land management and land use that used to work has now turned against us. 
instead of facilitating new development and working to ensure that it's carried out responsibly, the federal government now routinely denies our opportunities and locks up Alaska's lands. No matter where we look, we face this gauntlet of land use and environmental statutes that have been twisted into permitting delays, project denials, endless litigation. And put at risk is the sound economy that we have worked very hard to build the livelihoods of hundreds of thousands of Alaskans and our ability to live up to our obligation as statehood to remain financially solvent as a state. Mr. President, we are in this position for, I believe, one reason, and that is because the promises that were made to Alaska by the federal government have been broken. We have asked nicely, perhaps too nicely, for a long time for those promises to be honored. So before I close, I would like to, to draw one more quotation from Senator Greening, who I spoke of earlier. And this is a rather lengthy quote, but it, it, is, one, uh, it is one worth hearing. And Senator Greening states, We Alaskans believe passionately that American citizenship is the most precious possession in the world. Hence, we want it in full measure. Full citizenship instead of half citizenship. First class instead of second-class citizenship. We demand equality with all other Americans and the liberties long denied us that go with it. To adapt Daniel Webster's famous phrase uttered as a peroration against impending separatism, we Alaskans want liberty and union, one and inseparable, now and forever. But the keepers of Alaska's colonial status should be reminded that the 18th century colonials for long years sought merely to obtain relief from abuses for which they, like us, vainly pleaded before finally resolving that only independence would secure for them the life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness which they felt was their natural right. We trust that the United States will not, by similar blindness to our rights and deafness to our pleas, drive Alaskans from patient hope to desperation. Now, Mr. President, that's pretty lofty language, I grant you, but I think that it is suited. I think it is suited to this, this conversation this evening, just as Ernest Greening had to have this same fight from this same chamber over 50 years ago. I feel compelled to remind this body that the greatness of this nation, the ultimate and true greatness of this experiment, depends on the greatness of the individual states which comprise it. And as we look at our states and what they are capable of achieving, I would bet Alaska's potential against any other. So today, on the 144th anniversary of Alaska Day, I would ask the Senate to just think, to consider the promises that were made to the state of Alaska, to realize that those promises have not been kept but broken to the detriment of both Alaska and our nation as a whole. And this must be changed with the realization that partnership, not abject denial, is truly the best path forward. If the federal government keeps its promises, Alaska will realize its potential, grow as a state, and secure its future. And Mr. President, we would not be doing this just for Alaska alone. The rest of the nation will benefit greatly as well. And that's something that we need. It's something that we should all agree to work for. And there's probably no better time than today as we recognize Alaska Day. I thank you for the attention uh, of, the, of the presiding officer. And uh, I, I thank you for the opportunity sh to share a little bit of Alaska's history and our frustration with our present. So thank you, Mr. Mr. President, and I yield the floor. Mm -hmm. Suggest the